welcome to the award-winning Thoughts from a Page podcast, a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network, hosted by me, Cindy Burnett, a voracious reader and book columnist who provides you with engaging author conversations and book recommendation episodes, as well as insider information on all of the newest releases that I personally endorse and on the publishing industry in my behind-the-scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. For more book recommendations and to find my backlist of interviews, visit my website at thoughtsfromapage.com. If you are interested in accessing unique bonus content, I hope you will consider joining my Patreon group. I offer two levels, Page Turners, which includes my popular Early Reads program, where patrons have access to monthly early digital reads through NetGalley, and exclusive pre-publication author chats, as well as regular bonus episodes and fun surprise content. My second level is Lit Lovers, which includes all of the page turner benefits, as well as my Traveling Galley program, where patrons can read at least three to four new titles a month that are in print galley form and are passed along to other members. One of July's selections is the new William Kent Kruger book, The River We Remember. In addition, there are two monthly episodes, fiction-nonfiction pairings, and spoiler-filled interviews with three authors. The link to join is in my show notes. Today, I am chatting with Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray about the First Ladies. Marie is a lawyer with more than 10 years' experience as a litigator, a graduate of Boston College and the Boston University School of Law. She is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of The Only Woman in the Room, The Mystery of Mrs. Christie, Carnegie's Maid, The Other Einstein, and Lady Clementine. All have been translated into multiple languages. She lives in Pittsburgh with her family. Victoria is an acclaimed author with more than one million books in print. She has written more than 20 novels, including Stand Your Ground, an NCAA Image Award winner for Outstanding Fiction, and a Library Journal Best Book of the Year. She holds an MBA from the NYU Stern School of Business. As you will hear in the interview, we had a variety of technological challenges, so I apologize in advance for that. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists, it is tested for 950 contaminants, and is NSF certified for sport, it is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Victoria Marie. I am so glad you are back to join me again on my podcast. How are you both? Wonderful. Good. And we're so happy to be back. Yes. Well, I'm so glad you're back. I interviewed you all really early on in the personal librarian process. And have you just been amazed at the length of the support for that book? I mean, I feel like people are still talking about it all the time. Like it is just not going away in a really good way. It's been mind blowing for us <laughs> on so many levels, not just the number of readers that we're reaching, but also the, the manner in which they are being moved by this book. Would you say that's right, Victoria? Yeah, def- it, we can't believe it. And they're still talk, like you said, people are just still discovering it. I didn't think that was possible um, because if so many people had already started reading it and were talking about it, it doesn't stop. It's been an amazing blessing. Yeah. Well, I think that is so exciting. I loved that book so very much. So congratulations. And that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And now we can talk about the First Ladies. Why doesn't one of you give me a summary of the book? Sure. So the First Ladies is many things, but Most of all, it is the exploration of the world-changing friendship 
between two incredible women, one of whom you know or think you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, and a woman who not as many people know her as she sh- as she should be known, and that's Mary McLeod Bethune. She was well known in her time as an educator and um, advocate for equality. And these two women came together in an era of segregation and Jim Crow laws to become not only best friends, but unified to to really lay the foundation for the civil rights movement. How did you learn about the relationship? And then how did you decide to write about them? Well, Marie was the one that discovered the relationship, but we decided to write about them because, as as you mentioned, when we went out on the road for the personal librarian, people loved this book, but they were even more fascinated with our relationship. And we realized we thought we were writing about a person only when we were writing the personal librarian. And we discovered we were writing about a lot more and people wanted to talk about more especially the conversation of race. And so with this book, we definitely were looking, we were on a mission and we selected a story with a purpose. And Marie had discovered their friendship, but as she said, there wasn't much written about it. So we were able to take what we knew about the two of them and bring it together in their friendship. I was unaware that they even knew each other. So I loved learning about each of them, which I knew a little bit about both of them or some about both of them but learning how they became friends and and what that did for both of them and how they benefited. Yeah, it was it's amazing the way in which we got to see Eleanor Roosevelt really transform really from the beginning to the end of our story through her relationship with Mary McLeod Bethune and the way in which Mary learned also from Eleanor and then how they used sort of the the strengths and access and different approaches and confidence that each one of them had to really grow both as people, which is not what real friendships are supposed to be. They, you know, they're supposed to be this opportunity to grow as people. Did you find parallels in their relationship and your relationship? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh <laughs> and, you know, we like to tease people and say this book is kind of semi-autobiographical, uh, especially when it got to the friendship part. Because we can imagine the conversations that they had, even the tough conversations they had from the tough conversations we've had to have about race, about the inequalities, about seeing things through each other's eyes and they're not the same. But we also got to have the fun stuff because what did they talk about as friends? We thought about what do we talk about as friends? Losing weight, food, clothes, all of that stuff. So That part, I don't want to say anything is easy because nothing is easy in writing, but it was simple. It felt natural. That's a perfect way to put it. Natural. Well, and I really enjoyed the parts of Mary's story where she was understanding how Eleanor was seeing things and having to educate her at times and explain sometimes Eleanor's comments. She was like, yeah, she clearly doesn't understand how these things work. So that was helpful for me, you know, to to understand, okay, that that's a useful thing to keep in my own brain. And so I'm sure you all were having those conversations on a much larger scale. But even for me reading the book, I felt that it was a great learning experience as well as an entertaining story. Oh, thank you. That's what we hope for to, you know, to really, you know, our mission is to change readers' hearts and minds sort of one, one story at a time, one experience at a time, one conversation at a time. And, and that's exactly what we hope to do. So what was the writing experience like this time around? Last time you were writing one person, this time you're writing two and their relationship. So how did it differ and how was it the same? It was still pretty much the same. When we're doing a collaboration, one of the things that Marie and I want to do is to make sure every word of this book is written together. And so we did the same, we had the same process where we talked about the overall arc of the story and then we would discuss the chapters And then this time, who wrote the first draft was clear. I was going to do Marie and Marie and Marie was going, I was going to do Mary and Marie was going to do Eleanor. (laughs) And then, but we still switched the chapters and we would still cut and paste and add things in and, and, or I would say to Marie, I want you to talk more about this. Or she'd say to me, we're going to cut that. So it was really, there were so many parts that were the same. The only thing that was different was at this time, it was clear, even though at first I wanted to write Eleanor 
and have Marie write Mary. But there were little nuances that I'm really glad we did it the way we did. And in that way, the, the process was so similar as the personal librarian. We sort of followed that same approach. The primary difference, I would say, is in the personal librarian. It wasn't always so clear who would write that first draft. It wasn't delineated from the outset. You know, we made that decision more on interest and um, areas of expertise and, and those sorts of things. But we would still always, you know, sh- uh, switch the switch the chapters, have the other edit, discuss them, and, and really try to make it as seamless as we could. So you start out, decided who's writing which chapter. And after Victoria writes a chapter about Mary, she sends it to Marie, and then Marie goes through it, provides comments. Is that kind of what that process is like and vice versa? Yes. And we're writing and we're writing at the same time, you know, so we're writing our chapter. So we're switching and putting it in order and we're able to write from one document. So we're a, which is really helpful. It's not a situation where I'm writing in on a one form and Marie's writing in another one. We're in the same document writing. And so all, and I can see her writing faster than me and trying to catch up. (laughs) <laughs> and you're saying, hi, Marie, slow down. <laughs> uh, the other thing that's hard about that, if you, I don't know what you're using, what platform, but Google Docs, like if somebody's writing above you and you're writing down below, it kind of shifts the document too. So sometimes that may kind of mess you up. At least it messes me up. We're not that technologically savvy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just curious. I was like, hmm, wonder how that works. Yeah, no, there are a lot of logistics. You know, there's there's sort of the big picture creativity piece of it. There's the the writerly, creative and personal connection. But there is also the logistics part of it, which is, you know, is something that we have to work out. And as you probably have noticed from today, we're not super tech savvy. So there you go. <laughs> you know, tech is really difficult. And that's one of those things that I never realized I would have to know so much about when I was doing a podcast. But yes, it, there's always a problem. It's great until it's not, you know. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, what about research? What did that look like for the two of you? Well, you know, I would I would start out by saying that our goal is is the same always, and that is to find whatever we can in the way of original source material, letters, records, articles, you know, journals, recorded conversations, whether by the woman that we're writing about or by somebody contemporaneous with her or who had personal recollections of her. And so, you know, this was an interesting um, experience because, you know, in some ways, for example, with Eleanor Roosevelt, so much has been kept, right, in various institutions, in the FDR library, a variety of archives. But the challenge from the Eleanor perspective was that not a lot was uh, recorded about their relationship during their lifetime. As you can imagine, these two women were very good friends working together together. Uh, sometimes in public, sometimes behind the scenes in an era of Jim Crow and segregation. So it wasn't like, um, yeah, the newspapers were were excited to cover that, right? So, you know, what we did find is we went deep into the archives sort of all around the country. And with a lot of a lot of time with a dusty microfiche machine, we're able to kind of extract some letters between Eleanor and Mary and between Eleanor and Mary and other people on all these different projects they were working on. For example, Walter White, who was the head of, head of the NAACP. And so that part of the research allowed us to stitch together a lot of the kind of contributions and legacy and, and more professional things that they were working on during that time period, as well as the newspaper archives, not of the mainstream media, but of the Black newspapers. The black newspapers, which uh, of the of which there were many powerful ones, including the Pittsburgh Courier, where I live, they were happy to record the support that these two women gave each other at conferences and events and award ceremonies and things like that. So, so putting those things together allowed us to stitch together really the professional side. But Victoria's deep research on Mary kind of gave us a different insight, wouldn't you say, Victoria? Yes, because I was able to actually go to Bethune-Cookman, which is where a lot of this book took place. I know the president of the school. And so I was able to visit her home and actually see where things were. And so when you read the book, if you feel like you're in her home, that's because I was in her home. And then the best thing that Marie and I had, because one of the things is that, yes, I focused on research for Mary and Marie focused for Eleanor. 
But if we found anything on the other, we gave it to the other. You know, we just kept doing it. Um, But one of the best things I had was a self-published book by her grandson called Mother Dear. And it was just, and since he's a major part of, Albert Jr. is a major part of the story, it was just a, a phenomenal piece to have because it was like him sitting in front of us telling him the, us the story of his grandmother. So that was amazing. And then his grand, the, that grandson's daughter was alive and working at the film cookman. So I had a chance to meet her and she was just so very excited about the book as well. Okay. That is really cool. And I bet it was really wonderful to read that book, but also their letters. I mean, sometimes I think when you look at those older letters, it really just almost transports you back yourself. Yes. Yeah. I I mean, I will definitely say the letters were of a more professional nature. So we sometimes didn't get those, like those, those deep, not all of them, but most of them, I will say definitely the more like uh, our sense of what the one-on-one behind the scenes moments drew from wonderful excerpts um, from the, the grandson's autobiography, where he's talking about Mary and Eleanor giggling like schoolgirls, you know, late at the night at their house, the special room at, at Mary's home that was just for Eleanor. So, you know, it gave us insights into things that were really not easily available. And also given the fact that really, as far as we can tell, there have been some, you know, articles and, and uh, a children's book and some some different things out there, but there hasn't been the super deep dive into their friendship on a nonfiction level that that you might have expected, which which was surprising to us. So we we were out there, you know, really trying to figure it out for ourselves. And and that's again where fiction comes in because it allows us to take what we know of their characters, what we know from the research, and logically extrapolate into those unknown areas a story that that we envision to have happened. Absolutely. And I guess it's sort of a double-edged sword. Surprising that no one has written very much about the relationship, but on the flip side of it, nice, because you're the first ones to get to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, the friendship was real. The two of them appear on the cover of Ebony magazine, where Eleanor has a quote of, this is her best friend. She's one of her many friends. So we're excited. We knew that this friendship existed. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It is really beautiful. Well, my next question was going to be what surprised you the most. It may be what we just talked about, but was there anything else that surprised you when you were writing this one? My gosh, I felt like there were twists and turns at every corner. What do you you think, Victor? I don't know if I was surprised, but there was always twists and turns. You know, one of the things that surprises me is the research and that no matter where you are in the process, you're always going to discover something new and something surprising. And we were um, near the very end when Marie and I discovered, uh, you know, something big for the book. And and it was just surprising and wonderful and a shock and, and all of that. So research surprises me. Um, the things that we find out all along the way. What about you, Marie? I think, I mean, there were certain big historical events, movements, developments that I had been aware of, but I I had no idea Mary and Eleanor played such an enormous hand. And I hope this isn't too much of a spoiler, Victoria, I've got to mention it. But, you know, I live in a town where there there were many Tuskegee Airmen. And of course, you know, people know about Tuskegee Airmen now and, and their their fight to participate, all the incredible um, undertakings they had. And the the role in which these two women made that happen is just it is mind boggling, and I had absolutely no idea about that. And um, and that's just one of many many examples of things that they are really responsible for that they fought for these two. And I think the other thing this is like not a twist and turn, but gosh, Mary's tenacity was just her force of will and her her perseverance was was like a a force of nature. It was unbelievable. And and she never stopped surprising and astonishing me along the way. Well, I always think it's so interesting to ask that question because I get the most fascinating answers and sometimes things I would never expect. So I love that question. What about the cover and the title? You know how much I enjoy those things. And I would love to hear how your beautiful cover came about. Well, gosh, um, the cover, you know, Victoria and I, 
have many talents, but drawing, I don't think is one of them. (laughs) And we are so fortunate to have such incredible artists who are, you know, behind us. And, you know, what, in this particular instance, we, Victoria and I brainstormed about how do we envision them? What, in what ways do we think, what is emblematic of them, um, their friendship, their accomplishments? And so we kind of brainstormed ideas around that. Um, the two of them walking together, the sort of emblems and symbols of Washington, D.C. And and so we kind of gave all those ideas to the art department and they came back with several options, the two women in a variety of monuments. And and gosh, I think the cover is so striking and beautiful. Um, and this this was kind of the one that we settled on. I will say the one thing I, I really have to say I insisted on was, I don't know if you notice on the subway, I love it so much. On the spine of the book is a little image of of the two women walking, holding hands from the back. And I just, I love it so much. Like I wanted our, because usually spines of books are pretty boring. I wanted to see them even on the spine. And so they very kindly accommodated that request. Victoria, do you want to talk about the title? Because that's kind of interesting as well. Well, I'm just going to hop in really quickly before Victoria does that and just say, I had not even noticed that because I am sitting here holding the finished copy. And I love that detail. Such a great idea, Marie. Yeah, that was Marie. And it was so sweet. Watch the two of them together. Yeah. And then the title was almost an obvious one. I know people hear the term first lady and they automatically think of the wife of the president, but it has lots of meanings in the Black community. First ladies, the biggest term is the first lady of a church, um, the wife of the pastor. But if you look anywhere, Mary was known as the first lady of the struggle. She was that that's the title that she was given. And it was near the end of the book where we discovered who gave her that title. Well, I thought it was the perfect title. I was just curious if that was what you'd settled on from the beginning or if it was something you had to get to or how that worked. Yeah, from the beginning, we almost walked away from it because other people have used it, but it was just perfect for these two. Yeah. Well, Victoria and Marie, it was a pleasure to chat with both of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Joe. And And we're we're the the Professional professional Book Book Nerds. Nerds. Two Mondays a month, we interview authors and talk about their upcoming books, what drives them, and their go-to order at the cafe. On Thursdays, we share recommendations and dive into topics readers face, like how do I actually read the books on my to-be-read list? You can find the Professional Book Nerds podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to learn more about us? Our website is professionalbooknerds.com, and you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Pro Book Nerds. We hope you'll come and listen, and as always, happy, happy reading. reading! Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts from a Page. If you enjoy the show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts from a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Joe. And And we're we're the Professional Professional Book Nerds. Nerds. Two Mondays a month, we interview authors and talk about their upcoming books, what drives them, and their go-to order at the cafe. On Thursdays, we share recommendations and dive into topics readers face, like how do I actually read the books on my to-be-read list? You can find the Professional Book Nerds podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to learn more about us? Our website is professionalbooknerds.com, and you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Pro Book Nerds. We hope you'll come and listen, and as always, happy, happy reading! reading.